It's every player's dream to have a lengthy, successful career in the NHL, but sometimes having the right amount of skill isn't always enough. It's hard enough to sustain that high level of play, but sometimes there are just unforeseen circumstances that get in the way of a hockey player's dream career in the NHL. Keeping that in mind, here are the top six most bizarre NHL careers. Patrick Seeloff. Drafted 42nd overall by the Calgary Flames in 2012, saying Patrick Seeloff's ride in the NHL was a bumpy one would be an understatement. A lot of people come and go through the NHL, but not in the way Patrick did. After spending several seasons playing in the minors, Patrick Seeloff made a reputation for himself as a shutdown defenseman, meaning his offensive touch was never much on display, which is weird to say because in his two career NHL games played, he actually scored two goals. Yep, two goals in two games. Those are some pretty interesting stats, so why did he not get any more ice time? Well, let's get into it. Only seeing one game with the Calgary Flames and scoring in it, Seeloff spent his time from 2012 to 2016 in the Flames system. Eventually, Calgary traded him to Ottawa and in return, they received forward Alex Chason. Now with the Sens, Patrick was hungry to make an impact on the ice and hopefully find his way into the lineup. So at the 2016 Senators training camp, Seeloff met Ottawa's veteran forward Clark MacArthur in the corner and caught him with his head down. It was well known not just in the Senators organization, but throughout the league that Clark MacArthur suffered from concussions, but in the heat of the moment, Seeloff went in for the check and not only gave Clark another concussion, he ended his career. This one incident trashed Seeloff's entire reputation and he was eventually put on waivers and never saw ice time in the NHL ever again. Dan Blackburn In 2001, we saw something you don't often see happen in the NHL draft and that is two goalies being drafted in the top 10. Pascal Leclerc was drafted at number 8 and more importantly, Dan Blackburn drafted 10th by the New York Rangers. With high hopes for their first round pick, Blackburn was quickly thrown into the Rangers system as he played several solid games in the minors and eventually got called up to the NHL where he played 31 games in what was just his first NHL season. All this at the age of 18. That is a lot of pressure, but Blackburn was coming into the NHL with some impressive stats under his belt and was named CHL Goalie of the Year before he got drafted. Of those first 31 games in the NHL, Blackburn posted some average but not discouraging stats. He had a 3.32 goals against average, a .898 save percentage, with a record of 12, 16, and 0. Obviously, those aren't all-star numbers, but for an 18-year-old in the league to grab his team 12 wins, there was definitely potential there. The following season, Rangers starting goaltender Mike Richter missed the majority of the season with a head injury, opening up the net for sophomore Dan Blackburn to step in and take over. He played another 32 games that year, and although he posted his first shutout of his career, his stats weren't any better than the last season and still posted a losing record of 8, 16, and 4. It was brought to the team's attention that this workload may be too much, too fast for the 19-year-old, but being the hungry young athlete he was, Blackburn assured the organization that he could handle it. However, during the next season's training camp, Blackburn sustained a hand injury during a workout, severely damaging the nerves in his left shoulder. The damage was so bad, Blackburn couldn't even use his glove hand anymore. Well, a goalie without a glove hand certainly has no place in the NHL, but props to Blackburn for showing his drive and tenacity and eventually came back to play, not with the typical blocker and glove combo all the other goalies are equipped with, Blackburn became the first and only goalie to ever use two blockers. Yep, that's right. He came back and went with a blocker and blocker combo. You have to admire his determination and commitment to the game. Unfortunately, he never played an NHL game with the new blocker combo due to the league lockout, but he did try using it in an ECHL game, and sadly, it did not work to his benefit. It's an unfortunate situation to see such a young, promising player to have to call it quits, but at least he can say he gave it everything he had. Coach Ted Nolan Splashing onto the scene with the OHL Greyhounds, Ted Nolan's pro coaching debut was one that grabbed everyone's attention. He took the Greyhound to the finals three consecutive years and took back-to-back -to -back championships. It was clear he knew how to win. 
All this success led to Ted being given an opportunity that every coach dreams of. He was given a head coaching job in the NHL with the Buffalo Sabres. Continuing his winning ways in what was just his second season coaching the Sabres, Ted Nolan and Buffalo tallied a record of 40, 30, and 12 throughout their regular season. That performance led to Nolan not only being nominated for the Jack Adams Trophy for the Coach of the Year, but he actually won it. Now here's where the drama happens. During that second stellar campaign with the Sabres, forward Pat Lafontaine sustained a pretty substantial head injury that was the result of a huge open ice hit to the head. It was clear that Lafontaine was dealing with a major concussion and Ted Nolan told the Sabres organization that he refuses to play Lafontaine until he's made a full recovery. Now because this was a different time, the league, NHL teams, and fans really didn't care much about concussions or concussion protocols. They had no idea how severe the impact of these injuries could be, and they wholeheartedly disagreed with Coach Nolan. They wanted LaFontaine to play. It became clear that the organization and Ted Nolan were at odds, and because of this, rumors began to circulate about Nolan, tarnishing his reputation. Headlines were being released saying Ted Nolan was a drunk and had no clue what he was doing behind the bench, which to me makes zero sense considering his winning record and he won the coach of the year. It's unfortunate due to all this drama that Ted Nolan became the first head coach in NHL history to win coach of the year in one season and then in the following season be out of a job. Yep, that's right. They didn't fire him, but they did offer him an insultingly low one-year contract in which he turned down. For the next decade, Ted Nolan did not step foot on an NHL bench. He eventually landed his first coaching job in the QMJHL, and in his first year back, his team won the championship. Ted would eventually find his way back into the NHL, coaching for the Islanders and the Buffalo Sabres yet again, but both of those experiences came to an end due to several disagreements with team management. Link Gates one of the toughest players hockey has ever seen, Link Gates quickly made a name for himself as he was known for racking up the penalty minutes like no one has ever seen before. Playing in the WHL through 59 games, Gates had 9 goals, 20 assists, and 313 penalty minutes. He made a lot of noise during that season and was gaining recognition from the NHL scouts. So much so that at one point, he was projected to be a top pick in the upcoming draft. And then this happened. Link Gates showed up to the draft with two black eyes and a case of beer in hand. Now, up until this point, it was rumored that Gates would often get mixed up in a lot of trouble off the ice, but showing up like this draft day confirmed it for everybody and threw that previous scout projection right into the trash. Gates then went 40th overall in the 1988 draft and was drafted by the Minnesota North Stars, which with all things considered is actually pretty good. Apparently it was intended for Gates to be the Marty McSorley for Mike Medano. However, four months after being drafted, Link Gates was arrested and charged with drunk driving. The drama didn't end there. Gates ended up being suspended by his own team for smashing his hotel TV and throwing it out a window. He ended up being traded to the San Jose Sharks where he was able to get a little more settled into a role and is the franchise's all-time single season leader in penalty minutes with 326. Mind you, he put those numbers up in just 48 games played. Linkgate's career came to an end when he was part of a car accident in April of 1992 that left him with career-ending brain damage. Valery Nichushkin Valery Nichushkin has been written off as a bust not once but twice throughout his career so far. During his rookie campaign, Valery put up some promising performances as he tallied 34 points in 79 games played with the Dallas Stars. However, at the start of his sophomore season, he would deal with some injury problems and it was released that Valery Nichushkin would undergo hip surgery, sidelining the 19-year-old for the rest of the season. Now, heading into the next season, recovered and ready to play, Valerie came into the lineup with a reduced role on the team and struggled to fit in. Because of this, we saw his productivity regress and he was slowly fitting the mold of that first round bust. Eventually, Valerie decided to leave the NHL and headed over to the KHL as he was unhappy with his situation in Dallas. But that wasn't the last we'd see of him. His time in the KHL was brief, and by the time the 2018-2019 season rolled around, Valerie was back with the Dallas Stars. However, his comeback was quite anticlimactic as he'd only register 10 points through 57 games played, and even worse, he recorded zero goals. So, once again, Valerie began fitting the mold of that infamous NHL draft bust. He was eventually bought out of Dallas and inked a one-year deal with the Colorado Avalanche in 2019 
and this was the best possible career move he could have ever made. Nachushkin bounced back and became an important part of the Avs roster. He was actually runner-up behind Kale McCart for playoff MVP when the Colorado Avalanche won the Stanley Cup in 2022. Pat Verbeek, drafted 43rd overall by the New Jersey Devils in 1982, Pat Verbeek was a promising young talent for the organization and in his first season with the Devils in 1983, he put up an impressive 47 points in 79 games played. Verbeek proved to have great goal scoring potential and was a solid fit for the Devils roster at the time. However, shortly after his second season with the team, Pat spent his offseason working at his family's farm, which led to a freak accident. On May 15th of 1985, one of Verbeek's thumbs was cut off by an auger. What's an auger? That's a great question. I had to Google it, so let's throw up a picture. It's this scary thing. Jesus Christ. Luckily for Verbeek, his dad and his brother were able to locate the missing thumb and rushed to the hospital where they were able to successfully attach it. Now Verbeek wasn't out of the woods yet. It took some serious rehab to get his thumb in shape for the NHL, but what is so bizarrely impressive is that by the time the next season started, Verbeek was ready to go and actually didn't miss a single game due to losing his thumb. Putting the cherry on top, that season he scored a career high 25 goals in 76 games played. Pat Verbeek had a lengthy and successful career in the NHL and was able to hoist up the cup in 99 with the Dallas Stars. Thanks for watching our videos. Don't forget to hit that like button. And if you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe button. And we'll see you in the next video.